that talk with mom and dad and and I said I'm actually going to be leaving my career I'm going to be purchasing an old dilapidated restaurant in northern Saskatchewan and I'm going to be bringing it into my first gallery and they said son you're crazy you've got a great job you've got a bright future ahead we're we've been in business it's hard work you've seen that and uh, all the all the comfort well they couldn't talk me out of it (laughs) from other entrepreneurs, athletes, and cool people in general, all the while enjoying some Rose Bros coffee. This episode, we are joined by Jason Bantle, a professional nature photographer whose company donates 6% of all sales to the All in the Wild Land Trust, which to date has allowed for 1,600 acres of land to be purchased and set aside for conservation. Jason grew up outside of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and attended the University of Saskatchewan to study biology where he went on to complete a master's degree with a thesis focused on Arctic fox ecology. In 2005, Jason opened his first gallery just outside of Prince Albert National Park, Saskatchewan and since then he has opened galleries in Banff, Canmore, Niagara-on-the-Lake and most recently in Toronto. In 2019, out of 48,000 entries worldwide, Jason was one of 50 wildlife photographers to have their print displayed at the 2019-2020 Wildlife Photographer of the Year Touring Exhibit. Conducted for over 50 years by the Museum of Natural History in London, England, this is the most prestigious wildlife photography competition in the world and the only one Jason enters each year. Additionally, Jason was fortunate to be given the great honor of receiving the distinction of highly commended as a nature photographer. Jason's photos are awesome, and I was first introduced to them at his gallery in Banff. Since then, I've had the photo of the famous bedraggled eagle on my desk for whenever I'm having a bad day. You can find Jason's work on his website, allinthewild.com, as well as on Instagram, and his media interviews on CTV, CBC, The London Times, USA Today, CNN, and among others. It was a great episode as we talked about the famous grizzly bear number 122, the risks and adventures of photography, trips to Africa, and wildlife conservation in general. Apologies in advance for the scratchy audio at times as the internet was a bit spotty. Also, if you get a chance to leave a review of the episode in the Apple directory, it will go a long way to helping the show. Enjoy! Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thanks for having me, Trevor. I really appreciate your time. Cheers. For people listening, this is Jason Bantle, professional photographer. Jason, can you explain what that is and what the business is and how you got into it a bit? So a professional photographer, I'm actually a professional nature photographer. It means that I make my living from uh, photographing nature and and I guess giving a voice to, to the animals. I did a master's in biology in the central Arctic of Canada, working on Arctic fox. It was very quick to me that that area of Canada needed to be shared with the world. A lot of people don't travel there. A lot of people uh, wouldn't know much about Canada's Arctic. So through photographs, I mean, it's basically photojournalism. You find out that, that photos are a universal language. They tell a story and that story can be very powerful. A lot of people are never going to see Canada's Arctic. Mm-hmm. Photographs was the way to share its beauty and and to message the importance of Canada's Arctic. I had the good fortune of being recognized on the world stage last fall, part of the World Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards Mm -hmm. in London. And I went to one seminar there and it was it was neat to have them talk about mountain gorillas specifically and how mountain gorillas are endangered. And back in the 1980s, they were on a really steep decline. But National Geographic published a, a cover photo of, of a mountain gorilla image. And at that point in time, the conservation efforts for mountain gorillas grew. And we have mountain gorillas now. They're still endangered, but, yeah. but we might have lost that in species. So the power of images, and, and as a nature photographer, I mean, that's really what I'm trying to, to that's my goal. My mission is to bring an appreciation of nature and, and with that, conservation of, of species. So you grew up in Saskatoon and went to the University of Saskatchewan, did a master's degree in biology, it looks like? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Did you get into photography in school or when did that really start to take over? <laughs> you know, I, I actually started when I was 14 already. My, okay. my parents had a camera for uh, Christmas, a point and shoot, and I went out and did all these artistic shots and got a little expensive for mom and dad processing all this film. Yeah. But real, the real time when it hit, uh, when I started my career, or launched my career, and my love of photography was was when I went up to Canada Central Arctic as a as a university student okay. helping out on a research of nesting geese. I borrowed my sister's camera, came back and realized I, I was in love with the Arctic. And next year I went up and I bought a used camera. So then I, I really started uh, getting into the photography and and had friends who were biologists as well. And we all kind of, we almost had like our own little photo club. We, we would critique ourselves or critique each other, you know, type of thing and get together and compare images. And, and it was really uh, just a, I mean, there's just a real passion there for, for the art form of photography and, and for nature. Yeah. When you finished school, did you think you're going to have to find a more traditional job or was photography the goal to make it a business? How did that come about? Yeah. Trevor, that was not the intention. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how many nature photographers make a living? Very few. Well, that's so I'm curious. And I mean, it's cool. No, it's it's a really neat, neat path that, that happened. So for me, I uh, grew up with parents that, that owned a small business. And I, I had a great job, Trevor. I, I was teaching sessional lecturing and teaching biology labs at the University of Saskatchewan. As you mentioned, I, I grew up in Saskatchewan. And so I had the regular job, future pension, all of that. Yeah. This thing just kept knocking on my shoulder of, of needing to, to do more. And, and that, yeah, you know, educating the young was great. Uh, giving, I have a lot of my students that went on to become biologists, which mm-hmm. are awesome. But there was a bigger way to make an impact of, of how to, the planet to me is a bit in peril. I think we all know that. And, mm-hmm. and how can you make a bigger impact? So Slowly, I moonlighted with with my art and with my photography and and selling fine art prints. And then I went home and I had a talk with mom and dad. And and I said, I'm actually going to be leaving my career. I'm going to be purchasing an old dilapidated restaurant in northern Saskatchewan. And I'm going to be bringing it into my first gallery. And they said, son, you're crazy. You've got a great job. You've got a bright future ahead. We're, we've been in business. It's hard work. You've seen that. And uh, all the, all the comfort, well, they couldn't talk me out of it, of course. Right. So my sisters had been up, uh, they had seen, seen the property that I was purchasing. A, a good friend who was a construction guy was up as well and saw it. And, and everyone thought I was crazy. There was bets uh, among my friends that I would only make it a week to uh, two weeks up at this dilapidated restaurant and I would tuck my tail and, and come back to my university job. But here I am some 16 years later and running a, running a photography art business and I'm a nature photographer. I Very mean, cool. uh, feel incredibly blessed, uh, incredibly blessed. I know, I know how lucky I am and I know how many fortunate little steps happened along the way. As you know, business is... There's, there's always luck involved too. Absolutely. So this would have been late twenties, early thirties, and I would imagine a bit of a risk. Did you have to take out a loan and all that sort of thing? Yeah. You know, I, I took out my first loan and there's, they always say there's three big risks in any successful business and they're right. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the first loan I, I got through, right. Uh, purchasing this dilapidated building and, and renovating it. And then the second one was major investment in some inventory for my company. And the third one was signing a lease that had me knocking at my knees. I mean, I, I signed a piece of paper that I realized I could lose my entire, everything I had worked so hard for, I could lose it all. So uh, that ultimate risk, you bet. When did the thought begin to occur in your head that nature was important and that we had a problem in society and that photography was kind of an avenue towards this? When did all that start to develop in your business plan and whatnot? I I feel it's a bit unfortunate that it happened a lot later in my photography career than I would have liked. Initially, as a small business, you're just, you're fighting to survive. Mm -hmm. You're fighting, fighting, you're putting out this fire, you're you're, you're building your brand, all those different things. The art business, it's the reality of any artist. There, it's not, it's not a lucrative career. And so just keeping the business alive. Yeah. And, and then 
stability came into the business and, and into my life a bit more, then I could go ahead and, and focus on what my true passion was. And that was the advocacy behind the images. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. And, and I hope to bring young photographers into my, into my company at some point and be able to, they can be young and they can have the energy to put that, to put their energy into the advocacy and not have to worry about the business. Yeah. You know, hey, I'm very lucky that I was blessed with the ability to to know some things about business, and I I thank my parents for that. And then, of course, to have the art side and and the abilities as a biologist to, because nature photography is not being a a really good nature photographer. You have to. It's not about necessarily knowing your camera. It's about knowing the nature. That's mm-hmm. actually the, the the real crux of of my career is that I. I understand because of my biology background and growing up in a rural area of Saskatchewan and spending a lot of time in the forest, I understand how to, how to find animals, uh, what their signs are, and then how to set up and be ready for hopefully capturing that moment of their life that is really unique and special. When did you start to realize the world was going through an environmental crisis? Was that later on in your 20s and whatnot, or was it after you started the business? <laughs> No, it was already in university. The reason that I had like, so it was already in my late teens and, and early twenties that I, I was already on that path along mm-hmm. with friends. That's why I went into biology. People will be surprised to hear this. I actually was a very good golfer when I was young really? and I had the option to go down the road of becoming a golf pro. You're probably uh, a lot better than me. Te- <laughs> yeah. Oh, not now. Yeah. <laughs> Trevor, <laughs> let's, let's not go golfing anymore. You're sandbagging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's how you pay the bills is uh, golf on the side. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Winter time, I head down south. Yeah. Nice. Hey, I'm a nature photographer. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of money in, go- in golf if you're good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, no, I think I was, uh, I, I realized early on and, and doing research on Arctic fox, that was my master's. Uh, it was great to do that research and biological research is so important to, to making good informed decisions for the future of our planet. But I realized that a lot of information was not getting out to the public and how could we get that information out to the public? And, and the way that I felt was best was through advocacy, through mm-hmm. talking. And even, even scientists, you know, people in the university system admitted that that wasn't their forte. They, they didn't want, they were there to do research. They weren't there necessarily to share the information. And I was like, well, I can be that liaison perhaps. And, and then the photography was the natural fit to be the liaison because the images are powerful and something we can talk about. Your first gallery was in Saskatchewan. Yeah. The second one, where was that one? Canmore, Alberta. Canmore. Yeah, so Canmore. How'd that come about? I think what I realized very early on was that that, that's a really great question. I realized early on that my message was bigger than, than perhaps the audience I could reach. And nothing against where my gallery is in Saskatchewan. It's just, mm-hmm. it's a very finite group of people. There's, there's only about 10 to, to 20,000 people that regularly visit here in the summer times. There'd only be kind of a 200 to 300,000 people that would come into this area on a seasonal basis. Mm-hmm. And I was like, where is there a big impact that can be made? And of course, that was that was the mountain parks. I mean, you get so many visitors out to the Canmore area. Mm-hmm. So that really my reason to to head to the, to the mountains. I've always been in love with the mountains. It's uh, one of those things that I just feel that the Canmore, Banff mm-hmm. area is a special area of, of this country. I, I've traveled the entire country except for the East Coast and Canmore Banff is just exceptional. It's incredible. And, and to have a gallery there and to be able to have international travelers come in and share my work and, and know that this message is being shared around the world, that's important to me. And, and I think that the advocacy is working. I, if we take the example just recently of Nakota bear, mm-hmm. the white grizzly bear right now, I'm getting messages. I got a message from Zimbabwe yesterday messages from Australia, Denmark. I mean, people who are, who are talking to me and saying, you know, what, what are we doing to protect this bear? What are Canadians doing? Uh, what is Parks Canada doing? So it's great to be having those conversations on an international basis and, and who knows where it can go. I, I'm a Canadian photographer and I really believe that we need to protect what is here in Canada. It's a, it's a very special country. I saw CTV News did an article on you yesterday, I think it was, with the story of Nakota, the white grizzly bear. 
how there's some issues developing around too many people coming to see the bear and him running across the highway and whatnot. So what measures are being taken to protect the bear, if any? When I went out to to photograph Nakota, that was not my my exact intent. I, I'm actually doing kind of a piece on on our rail system oh. through the mountain park and the dangers of that. And I knew Nakota was in the area. I'm a spiritual individual. So I had put a piece of flagging tape on a, on a tree that I wrote on it. Nakota, I will honor and respect you if you want me to tell your story. Hmm. Nakota wanted its story told, I guess, because it provided to me a couple opportunities to, to experience it. Uh, one opportunity that was, was optimal to get some great images. Really? Wow. And, um, I think that that allows a dialogue to start to happen. And as you mentioned, uh, the media has reached out, which then reaches out to the public. So I've had some contact from a couple media sources. I was interviewed this morning on the radio mm-hmm. and that allowed a dialogue with Parks Canada, of which is very important. And I did that back in 2014 with a group of bears that was in the Kootenays. Now I'm doing that with Nakota. And they, Parks Canada, are they're entrusted with, protecting, you know, our wildlife in the mountain parks. And, and they're a great group of people. They're well-educated. They have the safety and well-being of, of nature, uh, paramount, and they listen. They're, they're in the area where Nakota is now. There's electronic signboards. Uh, there's no stopping in place. They have more, more bear guardians on. So changes are happening. And, and right there, Trevor, there's your example of why... In my late 20s, I said, there's got to be something more that I can do. And, mm. and I'm actually it. And I feel very proud to be able to be involved in some of these issues. And, and to, I hope for the sake of, of Nakota that we're not talking about Nakota in the past tense in 20 years. We're talking in the present tense because we are losing a lot of bears on our roadways and mm. on the rail trips. And there's only 700 grizzlies left in Alberta yeah. and only 60 Banff National Park. They're a threatened species. So that's the worry is that we can put up all these guardrails and talk about it all, all we want, but then a semi comes barreling down the road one night on the highway or the train, and that's the end of it for the bear. Is that something you think about? Yeah, Trevor, that that keeps me up before I go to bed each night. Uh, that's something you and, know, I think uh, about all the time. Is it? It's just yeah. all it takes is one semi. And Trevor, I've I've witnessed the near misses and. It's not something that is easy to see. Right. And, um, you know, these animals are voiceless. And don't they have a right to be here as well? Yeah. And so we're racing down the highway and with no concern for these animals to a certain extent. And it's not the transport truck driver's fault. It's not anyone's direct fault. You have to decide how important are these animals to us and what rights do they have? And it all starts with, with, with everyone being educated and realizing too, that uh, we have to make some changes in our park system. Mm -hmm. The rail, the rail line has to change where these bears are, are forced to feed because there's food next to the highways has to change. And that, that's a bigger funding. That's a bigger funding issue that parks Canada. I, I don't know all of parks Canada, Canada's mandates and what their funding system is, but we have to try to produce some habitat that isn't beside the roadways. And that's partially too, just bears. It's bear biology. Uh, mm. There's big bears in the back country. These small young bears, Nakota's only a three year old. So these smaller bears, they get picked on by the big boys. Well, where are you heading? You're heading away from a big bear that might actually, you know, lethally um, eat you. you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, well, where is it better to be up against a, a roadway where at least I've got a chance or in the back country where I might get chased down and, and eaten. So, and that's bears. I mean, there's, that's not cannibalistic. That's just what they do. So, but yeah, you know, I, I don't know, Trevor, the, the situation with the roadway and such, it just makes me sick to think about Nakota out there at night and it's sibling and, and not just Nakota. Let's remember every bear is special. Mm-hmm. Yes, Nakota has a white coat and in indigenous culture that means a lot and, and it means a lot to me too. I'm a spiritual person. So not just an in indigenous culture and people like myself that are spiritual, white animals symbolize a time where there's an imbalance and we need to come back to balance. And so Nakota's come here to help us think about our balance in, in the ecosystem. And, and this little white headed 
grizzly cub, it's kind of interested now. Interesting. Now we have a white headed grizzly bear cub. I mean, mm-hmm. somebody's trying to tell us something. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of larger bears, grizzly bear number 122, I think you've shot him before? Yes, I photographed the boss, yep. How is that experience? Is it, are you scared or nervous or was it fun? It's nervous and I've at times maybe, the one image that really stands out is heading for hibernation. Yeah, that is a cool picture. Yeah, it's an incredible image and I was in the safety of my vehicle. The bear was lumbering very slowly. That was 19 images and only one image worked out, Trevor. Right. All 18 images had snowflakes in front of his eyes and I don't do any Photoshop. I've had a couple other opportunities to photograph the boss. Actually, we you know, should just explain the boss is the largest bear in the national park, just for people listening. Yeah, so the boss is the big boy of Banff area, uh, but he travels over to the other mountain parks as well. He's okay. other of 80... Five percent of the cubs in the valley so he's a busy boy uh, he's been hit by the train and survived and uh, he's actually eaten a, a black bear uh, on occasion to before he goes to hibernation so uh wow he's, he's quite the yeah he's the legend but but he deserves respect and i i have to admit as well that as a nature photographer sometimes you know you have to keep in check yourself as well and i've made i've made errors in, in judgment and such uh, when photographing some of these animals. And you have to recorrect. And remember that they're, they're, this is their land. This is their home. And when you go into their home, you have to respect that. And, and is the shot worth what is happening? Mm-hmm. So sometimes you have to question, you know, is this shot worth what the message is going to be? And recently I got a shot of the boss where... I hope the message is worth what, what the situation that I was in and such. Always respect is important. We don't have to really reveal where he goes and where he is, but how do you find him? Is that a scary process? How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, there's a couple bears out there that are actually quite a little bit predictable in uh-huh. terms of habits and such. And also, there's a couple bears out there. Bear 64 was one of these bears, and she was a famous female in the, in the area. And she was a bear that was very, very, uh, well, she had trained humans. If humans got too close, she gave a huff. Uh, she charged. She, she kind of had some rules about her. And, mm. and she was willing to tolerate people. And probably, to be honest with you, Trevor, again, from the standpoint of there's big male bears. Mm. So if I'm near humans, there won't be big male bears near, near me because the big male bears don't want to be near humans and my little cubs will be protected. So she had really figured out a great system and finding these bears and and knowing where they are, there's certain bears that I think it's like, okay, you can, you can probably safely do some photography with them from the safety of your vehicle for the most part. Hmm. Other bears, I'd be like, "Mm." and then again, you always have to think what's the consequences of the shot. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we go back to Nakoda, people might ask right now, are you going to go back and photograph Nakoda? Trevor? No, no, I, I brought a story. Nakota does not need any more pressure. If I'm out there and it happens, great. Mm-hmm. That's fine. If it's a respectful encounter and I can and I can do photography, I will. But no, I'm not going to search out Nakota and, and I really hope nobody else is either. The same with the boss. I, I don't think that it's a case of I need two hundred photos of the boss. Mm-hmm. I need to tell the story of the boss. And that's what I want to do as a nature photographer, then leave these animals alone. Leave them live their life. That that's what I want to do. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish. But I get it. It's a fine line. I ask myself this every day. And, and I've been grappling the last week since I photographed Nakoda, grappling with the whole concept of, you know, what, what's, where's the line on, on what is acceptable by a nature photographer that's trying to advocate for conservation. I hope I'm, I'm honoring and respecting these animals. I, I hope that, that I'm doing it right. That's the trick is you want to create awareness and bring attention to the conservation effort. But do you ever think about people seeing the images and then all they want to do is go and get an Instagram selfie with the animal afterwards? You nailed it. It's like you bring these beautiful images to people and then does that encourage the whole cycle of, well, I want to go get that image. Yeah. I'm hoping that that we can work out a, a better system in our parks. Somehow there's some models in national parks in the United States that seem to be working, especially for professional nature photographers. Mm-hmm. And uh, what 
professional nature photographers do in terms of bringing amazing images to the public, I think is important. But how do we do it in a manner that takes care of the bears and and that the public can can respect as well? Because, yeah, you know, I, there was on one of the interviews this morning, there was a little bit of preamble about this young family that came across this white headed little grizzly cub and how their four year old is such a nature lover. Mm-hmm. I want to encourage that, yeah. Trevor. You love to be there because that little four-year-old may be a biologist and a nature photographer. And yeah. So you want to encourage that somehow, but how do we do that so that everybody kind of is is doing this with the number one priority that the bears and, and their livelihood, their life is protected and respected. I use the analogy of Imagine you have got this hunger that you can't even fathom. You haven't ate in days. They just came out of hibernation. They have all kinds of hormones racing through their, their body. I'm hungry. I'm mm-hmm. hungry. You go down to the, to the only area where you feel safe because of other bears and you start feeding next to a busy roadway. And you're having, you're, we're in our homes. Imagine we're in our homes and we're having breakfast and 50 people show up with cell phones 10 meters away from us and are taking pictures of us in our homes. Yeah. And you deal with that day in and day out for days, weeks, months. And it's, we are putting a lot of pressure on these bears a lot. Absolutely. I read an article about <laughs> Moraine Lake in, on that same topic and how Instagram has made it so busy that one of the reasons they have to patrol it and close it off now is due to that social media presence. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, this is a tough job, Trevor, and <laughs> Parks Canada know that their funding is very limited. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be very, give them grace, I guess, is the word to say, and help them along. When they when they put out guidelines for us, let's follow them. Let, let's, let's follow what they're asking us to do. Let's mm-hmm. care of our, our resources, our natural resources here in Canada. It's an incredible country when you look at what we have in this entire country. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could be world leaders in our conservation efforts and protection. Do you have a favorite place to take photos? Is there one place that sticks out for you? I do, by far. The the polar ice, the uh, Arctic ice uh, photographing polar bears is my, (laughs) what do we call it? Favorite. My need. Yeah. Yeah, my need. It's not a favor. It's a need. Okay. (laughs) With COVID this year, I, I couldn't go up to the ice. It's where I feel in my element. It's raw nature. You're in a situation where you're dealing with a carnivore that will eat you (laughs) and sensitive and you're hyper aware and you're hyper respectful. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I feel the polar bears are the canary in the coal mine for global climate change. Mm -hmm. And as things change in the Arctic, it, it means changes for the entire planet. And so trying to keep bringing that message of how important polar bears are with the the idea behind it that if we save polar bears, we're going to save a lot of this planet. Taking photos involves a lot of patience. How did you become so patient? Was that always a skill you've had or is that something you developed? <laughs> what happens when you have to go to the uh, washroom? <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky that way that I, I don't mind sitting and waiting. Uh, okay. I do a I tend to do a lot of thinking during that time. Mm -hmm. But one comment I would make on that, Trevor, is that I don't know if it's patience. Let's not forget that if you if you open up every sense of yours, your your sense of smell, your sense of taste, your hearing, you're not sitting. You're not you're not waiting. You're experiencing. Mm -hmm. It's actually an experience. And so if you take everything in, it's like, okay, well, whatever I'm trying to capture isn't here right now. Boy, this has been six hours, but has it been six hours? Because it's been a six hours of an incredible experience mm-hmm. if you actually tell in. And sometimes I have to remind myself because the time can get long. I remember one time I was sitting in a blind, you know, you talk about polar bears and, and yeah. danger perhaps. And, but you know, there's other situations that are dangerous. I sat in a blind one time for white-tailed deer mm-hmm. and it would be about minus five to minus 10 out. It wasn't super cold. And I had sat so still that uh, I didn't realize this could happen. I, I actually ran into a doctor who told me what exactly had happened. But I had sat so still that when I got up, I, I packed up my gear and I was walking down the trail about 100 meters. I got hypothermic instantly. And I was dressed well. Like I was, I was super well dressed. And I, I instant hypothermia to the point where I'm shaking. I'm just, I'm convulsing. And I'm like, holy smokes. Yeah. 
I get onto my all-terrain vehicle. I traveled in quite far into the backcountry in northern Alberta. And I got onto my all-terrain vehicle and I was traveling out. And uh, I'm shaking, you know. Wow. And I get accommodations and I'm like, I got to get a shower. I got to get a bath. And, and I strip down. And from my mid-thighs down, so from my quads down, my legs are completely white. Ugh completely white, like just white, like as a ghost. And what I found out was, was that I had sat so still that the blood in my extremities, especially my feet had pooled and had gotten cold and really wasn't moving through my body. And so when I stood up, all that blood started moving and my whole core got cold at that point. I could have had a heart attack. I didn't realize this. But this is, this wow. is something that can happen when people are hypothermic, that once you start moving mm. them, if they that cold blood comes to the heart and shocks the heart attack. Oh, <laughs> so, like, so some of this sitting and waiting, <laughs> yeah, I realized I am a very patient guy yeah. like, to not move an inch for those hours. Maybe that, a little that, too that, patient. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now now I uh now I move my toes all the time. Yeah. I'm about that. So anyway. But at the same time, when you're taking photos of bears, there's you don't want to move. It's if you move, you're yeah <laughs> in a tight spot. Yeah, it depends on the situation, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. With the polar bears, a lot of it is is sitting and, and just observing their behavior and photographing. So them. it's a heart attack or getting eat, eaten by a polar bear. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're well trained and you're smart and you're respectful, I don't think as a nature photographer you're risking your life on any more than anyone uh, mm -hmm. you know driving a Trans Canada on a given day. So uh, mm -hmm. I think it being smart. Do you have a favorite animal to take photos of? Is it the polar bear? Or? It's probably the polar bear, but uh, I will say that I, I don't really have a specific. I, I think that every, I, I think there's specific individual animals that I've spent time with over, over the years that I will always remember that interaction and all. They're all individuals. They're just like humans. They all have personalities. And, mm -hmm. and there's just some incredible encounters that will forever stick out in my mind and, and I will forever feel grateful for. Any particular animals that, have stuck out or characters amongst the animals? Yeah, yeah. There was a, there was a grizzly bear uh, cub uh, family, like a mother with two cubs up in the Kootenays. That was back in 2014 when that situation happened and I was involved in, in making sure that they were, were safe. And uh, there was one little cub in there on one particular evening that was just having a ball. Hmm. And was Parks Canada was parked there. They were allowing us to observe and photograph the bears, which was incredible. Hmm. And they were a safe distance away, kind of back in a meadow. And this little cub just had a blast. Really? I mean, it's just over the top, Trevor. So that that playfulness was, was incredible. There's a, a polar bear, a, a very large male polar bear up in the Arctic that I experienced that just the pure size of him as he walked toward me, looking at me on an eye level, even though I was standing up. I mean, that's how tall he was on all fours. And the fact that he really had no interest in me, he was like, hey, I'm just out here hunting seals. And that was, that was just a, a moment that I, I don't think I will, will mm -hmm. ever forget. There's been some... Uh, the bedraggled some, eagle? Yeah, well, the bedraggled eagle is... Yeah, I think that that was a given. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. But I think that that was a given that that will forever be a part of my life. To save that eagle, to see the worry in that eagle's face as I approached and me and my friends who were all biologists going, oh my goodness, we're going to have to euthanize this eagle because mm -hmm. we thought it was injured to the point of no return. And then realizing, no, he's just caught in the water. And his very scared face and then his sense of relief as he realized, I believe he realized because there was a change in his behavior, but his sense of relief when he knew we were there to help him and not to do something to harm him, that we were there out of good intentions. So that was, that was incredible. And then, yeah, some of the animals that I've handled as a biologist, you know, as, as I've worked on biology, like I've done some radio telemetry, so attaching radio collars to animals and such and working with those animals and having them in, in your hands and such. And just, I mean, it's incredible to experience. And then, you know, there's a very sad story of a, a Mi'kmaq. That's the anectotic word for muskox. And having a muskox calf while I was sitting in a blind photographing Arctic fox walk up to me and butt me at my knees and, and bawing because it was hopeful that I, it, I was its mom and, and it wanted to nurse. And knowing that the fate of the animal, I couldn't change its outcome. 
So that, hmm. that animal is sick because it had lost its parents. And two days previous, there was a blizzard and, and it's not uncommon for, for muskox if wolves would chase them to, to perhaps uh, abandon their young to save themselves. So that was a really tough experience. Absolutely. There's a lot of tough realities that go on in the wild. I would imagine you've seen a yeah, lot of that nature. firsthand. Yeah, you're right, Trevor. Yeah. Yeah. How about yourself? Have you, have you had an experience out there that's been really tough for you to, to see? Well, well, growing up in a smaller town and, and then spending a lot of time hiking and skiing and whatnot, you come across a few things. You know, a deer with a leg gone or something along those lines is pretty tough yeah. to see because what do you, what do you do? He's got three legs. <laughs> for some reason, the fourth yeah. one's missing and... I remember that happened once. Yeah. Was, you can't take yeah. it home. <laughs> no, yeah. No, nature is nature. Wild is wild. I mean, there's there's great organizations that rehabilitate animals out there and they're very successful. But you're right. A lot of times you, you can't solve these problems. Do you have a least favorite animal that you've taken photos of when that really just makes it difficult or <laughs> isn't cooperating? Mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mosquitoes. I would yeah, imagine, yeah. Up, mosquitoes and no CMs. I'm, I'm very allergic. So uh, those little guys are hard on me when I'm sitting in blinds uh, in the summer times and spring and fall. So, but no, I don't have a least favorite animal. I, they're all incredible. So, I think it yeah. was a year or two you did a trip to Africa and had a bunch of great shots of lions and animals there. How did that trip come about? That trip came about because uh, I am a Canadian photographer, but you know, ever since going into the field of biology uh, in, in university, it's always been a hope and dream to get to the savannas of Africa and yeah. see these. And I got into a migration of the guide said, he goes, I think there's a, a million animals here right now. Literally. It was mind blowing as far as the eye could see. And, and it made me think it's crazy. What entered my mind during that period of time was, to go, wow, this is what 150 years ago in Canada, when people were walking across our prairies, our grasslands, this is what they experienced with, with, bison i mean mm. there was bison as far as the eye could see as well so it's funny that that was one of the first thoughts that came into my mind but africa for me was just a lifelong dream it's a long way to travel it's a bit of a selfish travel in terms of the carbon footprint of that but mm. i i wanted to go as a, a nature photographer and i i spent the three weeks and i also encountered mountain gorillas and and chimpanzees so some of our closest relatives and and those were really intimate experiences and, and deep spiritual experiences for me to, to see our cousins and just some of the, the cats. And, and what's really different about Africa is that it's open landscape on the savannas, mm. like, like I'm here in Getty. And so you just can see so much. You see these elephants that are miles away and they're walking towards you. And an hour later, they're, they're around your Land Rover or whatever it might be. So uh, mm -hmm. there's incredible experiences over there in Africa that you, you're not going to get in, in North America or in Canada necessarily. Although some of our migrations up in Canada's north with, with the caribou and such are still spectacular. I mean, everything's spectacular, yeah. but a pure number of animals, the pure number of animals uh, in Africa just is, is mind blowing. Where, yeah. where and then you? specifically uh, in Tanzania, the Serengeti, and then into Rwanda and Uganda for chimpanzees and, and the gorillas. Of course, those are in a lot thicker forests than than the Serengeti. So, and then, yeah, just to get to witness some, some predator prey events out in the open where we saw lions take down a, a zebra, things like that. Some of those big cats, the leopards, wow. And the pure size of an elephant. You just, whoa, that's, yeah. that's mind blowing how big they are. So, yeah. Do you ever get a little nervous around the lions, like the grizzly bear number 122 or anything like that? Or is it a kind of a calm sense? It's a calm sense, but it's a it's a respect. There's definitely times I, I was photographing a, a grizzly bear up in the Yukon Northwest Territories, right right up in that area of Canada a few years ago, and and that was very nervous. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a bear that I didn't I didn't know anything about, right? Yeah. I mean, it's happened upon an encounter, and and it's like, well, where am I going to go? Because I'm in the middle of nowhere, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna photograph this animal and see what the behaviors are while I continue to, to give this animal a lot of space and it was feeding and such but at one point it began to walk immediately right in my direction their eyesight is not that great mm. and so trying to move out of the way and, and make known that I am not a threat and it was the time of year where they were focused on other foods so that's great but uh, being charged by muskox in the Arctic <laughs> when I was a yeah. when I was a grad student 
come over a hill and you're like, whoa, there's a herd of muskox. <laughs> and then they're like, we're charging you right now. Yeah. Another incredible encounter in the Arctic was, you know, talking about the savannas and all these animals. I mean, I was photographing a herd of caribou one time, was working up there on Arctic wolves. And this herd was estimated to be around 50,000 individuals. And so I was hiking out to photograph them one night and I was just on the edge of the herd. I mean, it was a great big herd and I was amongst some rocks and all of a sudden they changed their migration path. Well, holy cow, Trevor, I had yeah. big bull coming off my shoulders as, as they were migrating and just the insect life in this herd. And, <laughs> and I'm like, am I going to get out of here tonight? Like, how am I going to walk amongst these caribou and get out of here? But I was still on the edge. So eventually they kind of went back to their, their primary route and such, but, Oh, wow. That was, mm -hmm. that was, it was nervous. I mean, it's not just nervous. These big, these big carnivores, there's, there's other situations that arise that be quite uh, yeah. nervous. Well, that's like hippos. Apparently hippos can be very dangerous if you yeah. come across them in the river. Some of these animals yeah. that you maybe don't think of as being quote unquote dangerous can really sneak up on you. Yeah, my understanding is, is hippos are one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. Yeah. We were told that by our, as we photographed them. Yeah, you're you're photographing them in some watering hole, and you're like, these are dangerous animals. They look pretty lazy. And he said, no, they're not. They yeah, can be very dangerous. How long did you yeah. spend in Africa? Like a month or two? I was there. Yeah, just under a month. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that uh, given the travel, that I was spending uh, as much time as I could there and, and having the experience that I wanted to. Hindsight, I would have spent two months. Yeah. yeah, you know, affordability wise and just again that big travel, it, it would have been nice to spend two months, but not not possible for me. No. Have you been to Africa? Well, actually I have. Morocco was there wow. the, 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 wow. the north end, but obviously not the Serengeti. <laughs> yeah. Marrakesh is a cool wow. spot, but nothing like your travels, that's for sure. <laughs> Deep sea photography, have you ever thought about doing something with sharks or anything along those lines? No, nothing with sharks. I am starting to work on some underwater photography, but specifically in Canada. Okay. So I recently worked on a project with uh, river otters underwater. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was really neat to, to work on that project and, and get to see their lives. Uh, they spend most of their, well, not most, but a lot of their life underneath the water. Yeah. So, yeah, so getting into those other environments and such, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother branch of photography. I would imagine a bit of a struggle is what do you focus on? Do you have a set of priorities in terms of animals you want to shoot or areas or locations? So yeah, Trevor, you're exactly right. There's only so much time and, and some of these situations are only available during certain times of the year, right? So there's certain times when animals are here or there and, and you can actually respectfully photograph them and respectfully view them and mm -hmm. such. So, or there's something that you want to capture. What's really changed for me as my career has developed is now with the side of conservation and advocacy, I'm trying to direct my time toward, yeah, there's going to be things that come up like Nakota where you got to make time, but I'm really trying to go, okay, what, what is it that I, the message that I'm trying to bring to the public to affect some change and then focusing on that and working my schedule around that situation. So there's a couple different projects that are, that are very front and center for me right now. But of course, when you're out, other things happen, yeah. right? I mean, that's <laughs> just the nature of photography and of nature, right? Nature does its thing. Do you view a, a certain animal group or conservation problem as more important than the rest? Or is it all just connected? I think it's all connected. I think that the number one conservation issue that's facing Canadians and the nature in Canada and of course, the world is is global climate change. Let's let's be honest here. That's the number one problem. We just are in the midst of a pandemic that we know is because of globalization, because of the fact that we're encroaching on wild spaces throughout the world. We're having more contact with nature. That doesn't necessarily mean that good things happen. And the pandemic is one example of that, where this most likely came from a wild animal mm -hmm. transferred to humans. So... Global climate change is the number one issue, and that encompasses a lot of different areas, encroachment, disturbance, species decline, the melting of, changing of climate, excuse me, the melting of the permafrost in the Arctic, the changing of ocean currents. Is there one species that speaks that? No. Polar bears, again, are that canary in the coal mine that I think if we effectively change some things for polar bears, we're going to make changes for a lot of different species. 
but you might be surprised to, to learn this, but caribou are on a very rapid decline in this country right now. There's a number of species that people in Canada would be shocked to know that are in rapid decline. Songbirds. There's worrisome comments that we won't have fish in our oceans in, in a matter of half a century. Mm-hmm. Are we okay with this? Yeah. I'm a little bit, I'm concerned. <laughs> it's, if people aren't concerned, I, I'm shocked. I, I don't know what people are thinking here. And it doesn't, we don't have to change that much, Trevor. Anyway, it's not for me to, to tell people how to live their lives. People could point at me and say, you've got to change this and this. And I know that I have to make changes as well. Just the overall awareness, it seems like, is one of the main issues. Because I, I don't think a lot of people yeah. have the, if you don't leave the city very much or you don't get a chance to spend much time in the mountains, you just have no idea. Yeah, we have we have populations that are growing up in urban areas. Yeah. Connection to nature is is declining. Like having grown up in a rural area and such, I, yeah. I do think we're traveling out into the mountains and such. But that's not to, to say that people in the cities don't understand. They, they do and, and they care as well. I see that a lot through a lot of my collectors and, and people who visit our galleries. I mean, there are so many people that care from all different walks of life. I mean, it's not like, oh, that group of people, you know, they, they don't care. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I think let's talk about the situation of gas and oil. You could go, oh, well, you know, that group of people really doesn't care about nature. Look at, and it's, no, I, I don't yeah. believe that. At, I think that that group is trying to find more sustainable ways. Uh, energy is part of the world. I, I hope that we're working towards more sustainable choices over time. So to point a finger at a specific group of people or whatever I, I think is erroneous, I think that the more we can connect them, whether they do live in cities, but then connect them through nature photography, that bodes well for effective change and conservation. Do you have any good books you would recommend to people who are interested in learning more about a land ethic or conservation? Ooh, Ooh. well, <laughs> Oh, that's a big question. Holy smokes. There's no particular book that I've read that stands out. I I think that, wow. You know what? I I guess if I was to say one thing that I do a lot, Trevor, like the the books are great and there's great, nothing's coming to mind. Walden, maybe by Thoreau. (laughs) Yeah, well, of course. But, you know, I think one thing is, is Google this stuff. Okay, how many grizzly bears exist in, in Alberta? What's happening in, in Canada's Arctic right now with the permafrost? Get the, get the facts. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's little tidbits that if you just hit Google and use that resource, you can really educate yourself quickly. And yeah, you can, you can read a great book on conservation and such. But I think in this day and age, a lot of people like those little tidbits and they can learn a lot. And to get into a deep book when you're not a biologist, maybe that's not the route. Mm-hmm. It might be go, you know, do you want to learn something about polar bears, about Canada's polar bears? Do you want to learn something about Canada's permafrost? Do you want to know something about Canada's caribou? Do you want to know something about the boss and, and what's going on? There's there's a lot of articles on the boss out there written by by the media that are important and, and information from Parks Canada about the boss as well. So and now Nakota and and all these grizzly bears. So that's a great question. I, I don't want to point any of the uh, listeners to any specifics because I think that tidbits can be as powerful. Have you ever read a Sound County Almanac by Aldo Leopold? No. I was no. turned on to that book. Uh, Tim Ferriss did an interview with Guy who was in charge of recovering the wolf population in the States. It's Mike Phillips. Part of the Turner Endangered Species Fund and a whole bunch of other things. Anyways, Tim Ferriss podcast and... I thought that was a pretty good one, just on a land ethic and whatnot. But thought awesome. You know, well, great that you're pointing the listeners toward that. Yeah. So, we have some incredible environmentalists, conservationists on the planet right now. People who are really working in a in a really positive direction for for change, realization that that humans are part of the landscape as well and part of the environment. Well, I think that's a pretty good spot to wrap things up. I could talk about this with you for quite a while, but I won't take too much of your time. Do you have any advice for younger people or people in general looking to help out the environment or make a contribution? Yeah, you know, I think that I do. I I think that uh, to our young people, we need more people who are going to be advocates for nature. So if you're thinking of a career path, my suggestion is is that the employment in this industry will will grow Mm -hmm. over the next 100 to 200 years because of the necessity of the, the problem. So... If it doesn't, if it necessarily doesn't 
resonate with you, that that's the career path you want to go in, then I implore you to please be that advocate through the the career path that you do choose, whether you're an accountant or a lawyer mm-hmm. or an engineer. All the choices that we make, that's that's the number one the number one thing that we have as an individual in our society. Our choices are our voice. So make the choices that resonate with who you want to be and what's important to you. And I'm hopeful that people will choose nature. How about in terms of pragmatically creating a viable solution to an environmental problem? One of the cool things about your photography business is you actually have a business that supports it. What advice would you give to someone who is actually looking to make a difference instead of just talking or virtue signaling? Excellent. I think it's, it's companies like yours and companies like mine that have a conservation side to it. I mean, we give 6% of our sales back to conservation. Yeah. What is that? The land trust? The land trust. Yeah. So we purchase land for nature. We're also involved. I work with the Nature Conservancy of Canada and we're working on a plan to, to be in partnership with them directly so that we can make our conservation contribution even larger. They have ways of of getting more purchasing power through grants and such. And so through that, making the 6% go even further. So 6% of every sale of my art goes into into our land trust. And that land trust purchases land to be set aside for homes for nature. It's it's just homes for nature. So, and it's done with the idea behind it, like with my biology training to purchase lands that are very high quality habitat. For, for nature that have a variety of animals have a reason why to purchase, not just to purchase for the sake of purchasing. So that's what that is in terms of pragmatic. Yeah. Boots on the ground. I mean, I think that, that people, young people can, can go ahead and, and find jobs in conservation, start organizations and keep getting the message out there. There are a lot of photographers. If we're speaking specifically about nature photographer, there are a lot of young photographers right now that are incredible photographers that are providing an incredible message and leading an incredible example in life and good on them. I'm, I'm midway through my career and we need a young group to come up and really continue to be advocate and share the message of, of what can be done. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. I really appreciate your time. I won't keep you too much longer here. To leave things on a lighter note, maybe I'll avoid golfing with you, getting on the golf range ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't seen my golf game lately. I, I, I tend to do more time in the outdoors doing photography than golfing. So uh, we, we, might be, we might be quite competitive. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> keep up the good work and keep up these podcasts. I think that anything that, that brings nature to the forefront and helps with conservation is a great example and you will set that trend for the future so my hat off to you because a lot of companies that are involved in your industry are not doing that and so congratulations trevor on being an advocate for nature way to go thanks appreciate it already we'll leave it there hey everyone thanks for listening hopefully you enjoyed the show if you liked what you heard head over to rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming episodes you can also find our coffee and chocolate there where we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with One Tree Planting, a non-for-profit organization focused on global reforestation. Otherwise, until next time, happy coffee drinking.